You're watching 7 Action News, always taking action for you. This is the fight of my life. Tonight, that fight is over. And the Fed scored the knockout blow. This uh, ranks to me as the most complex and sweeping corruption I've ever seen. The corruption is breathtaking. It was a six-month showdown that had it all. Mr. Ferguson is not guilty of all charges. We have a defense. We can't get a fair trial here in Detroit. Tonight, the team that led the way tells you what it all means. Or was that a payoff? Did he bribe you? This is a 7 Action News special report. The government called Kilpatrick's time in office, Kilpatrick Incorporated, and produced a mountain of evidence along with 100 witnesses for the prosecution to prove their case. Now here's a look now at the number of counts each defendant faced. Starting with Kwame Kilpatrick, he faced 30 federal charges including RICO, extortion, and bribery. His friend and former city contractor Bobby Ferguson was on trial facing 11 counts, also including RICO, extortion, and bribery charges. And Kilpatrick's father, Bernard, faced four counts, including RICO, extortion, and filing false tax returns. Now those are the charges, now the verdict. Kwame Kilpatrick, guilty, 24 federal counts. Bobby Ferguson, guilty, nine counts. And Bernard Kilpatrick, guilty on one count. And another stunning victory for the prosecution today, both Kwame Kilpatrick and Bobby Ferguson taken into custody following the bond hearing this afternoon. Good evening and thank you so much for joining us. This case, historic, the verdict, astounding. It took five months of testimony and cross-examinations. Once both the prosecution and defense rested their case, jurors deliberated for 14 days to bring us to this whirlwind day. And the 7 Action News investigators on top of this case every single step of the way leading the charge. Heather Catalo is joining us right now and it was just an amazing day. Absolutely. To witness after these five months of, of trial. Absolutely historic. And after all of this time, 91 different witnesses, so much testimony, almost a thousand exhibits came down to 12 people. Those 12 people believed the government and that City Hall was for sale while Kwame Kilpatrick was in office. He, of course, was convicted mm -hmm. on the racketeering, the RICO count, as well as extortion and bribery, mail and wire fraud. Those were all for the Kilpatrick Civic Fund, which, of course, as you know, we exposed years ago some of the wrongdoing with that fund and, of course, the tax charges for Kwame now, Heather, you've been on this case from the very beginning. I think one of the shocking things that I heard today, Kwame Kilpatrick in court with his mouth falling open once he heard the convictions one by one by one. Were you surprised by his reaction? Did he not expect to get convicted? Did he think he would walk or any idea? It's hard to say, of course. We can't get inside somebody's mm -hmm. mindset. Obviously, he was very confident coming into court each day. The defense teams were very confident, and they felt like they really had um, shown the jury some reasonable doubt. I mean, they kept saying that to us over and over again, and upon cross-examination, they did do a pretty good job of poking some holes here and there, but when you, when obviously, when the jury weighed the evidence, and I think I spoke about earlier today, when you went back and really looked at all the text messages, and you put them in a chronological order in the case, it's really stunning what was going on behind the scenes and what was written in those text messages. Let's break it uh, down defendant to defendant. First of all, Kilpatrick, what, in essence, is this, this umbrella of conviction saying he did? Clearly, they, the jury felt that he w was cashing in on being in office. And obviously, the allegation was that Bobby Ferguson got all these multi-million dollar water deals and then water department deals, and then obviously somehow they were sharing the funds. And of course, the bribery charge that they were both convicted on was a payment, $75,000 from Bobby Ferguson to Kwame Kilpatrick. It was a, it was a payment to the Civic Fund. Um, the other charge they, they, they were not guilty mm -hmm. on, but um, that one, um, Clearly, that was the money, the, the, the link. I mean, it was a little difficult to show cash. Like, how do, they never were able to correlate the cash coming into different accounts with each other, but clearly there was enough cash that the jury had reason to suspect. How do you think people are reacting? I mean, when you think about Kwame Kilpatrick, so much, so much promise years ago, standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with our now president, Barack Obama, and then you have someone like Bobby Ferguson. He was just voted 40 under 40, 40 under 40, not so many years ago. I mean, both promising careers, and yet today, here they are behind bars again. It's really sad, obviously. Um, people that, I mean, Mr. Ferguson, by all accounts, by the witnesses they brought in and by what the defense would say, he was actually quite good at what he did, but as far as the actual work, so it, it's hard, to, it's just really sad. People with talent, obviously, now to see what's, what's happened in our city, it, it just paints Detroit in a terrible light. But in following this case, I mean, do you think Kwame Kilpatrick is the one who lured Bobby Ferguson into this? No insider information. 
I, that I, I'm not going there. I don't. I, you, know, they, you know, they presented the evidence, and and that's hard to say. Yeah, clearly, I think uh, Barbara McQuaid, and we talked uh, uh, earlier today uh, with her about that, said this is now the uh, the 35th, is that the 35th conviction uh, in this entire umbrella of what's been going on here. So there's clearly a culture at City Hall of corruption. But, and if you believe it started at the top, this was the top. Absolutely. So clearly, um, this, this whole concept that um, people could be bought people could be bought and and that's really sad and, well, and let's hope that it's done well Heather you've done a great job as we've said all along investigating this case we appreciate you. just how you guys have covered it all right thanks Heather and within hours of that verdict Kwame Kilpatrick and Bobby Ferguson were back in court this time fighting for their very freedom their lawyers arguing for bond for the two men but judge Nancy Edmonds wasn't buying the defense lawyers arguments both men were put in handcuffs immediately after the hearing and led away by federal marshals put into those vans where they were taken to the federal correctional facility in Milan. They have been given numbers now by the Bureau of Prisons. They will be assigned to their cells and they'll be housed in Milan until they are sentenced, which could be three or four months. Bernard Kilpatrick will remain out on bond, though, until he is sentenced. Public officials who uh, create that culture of bribery and pay to play, if you will, that is uh, so poisonous to city government. We are joined now by U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid and Robert Foley. Uh, thank you both for coming in and talking about this case. I mean, it's a historic day, a sad day, of course, in the city of Detroit. Uh, Barbara, let's start with you. This has been a long haul. You guys have been investigating this case since 2004, yet it all came down today. Uh, today, you know, is a day that uh, I like to say is not about the past, though, even though this investigation spanned all those years. But I think it's about the future because I think through this jury, this community has spoken that um, we're not going to stand for this kind of government in our community. And I hope that it will deter candidates in the future who seek public office from committing these kinds of crimes. Now, Robert Foley, you were the FBI special agent in charge of this case. Why was it so important to tackle something like this? And how did you get that first piece of evidence that made you launch into this investigation? Well, back in 2004 and just actually prior to that, information would come in from informants, from contractors who perhaps uh, didn't win a contract because it went to somebody that was willing to pay to play, or through anonymous uh, letters and information from folks that worked within the city hall. So looking at a scheme so broad and so pervasive it was important for us to make sure that we followed it through to the end so that we got to the result that needed to be reached and so that we um, arrived at justice. Obviously, the jury did hang on a couple of different counts. Do you have, looking back, do you have any regrets? Were, were certain things too complicated, do you think, for them? Or do you think they just could not come to agreement? It's hard to know what goes on in the mind of a juror. We were constantly battling internally between wanting to be thorough and make sure the jury had enough evidence to make their decisions, but also trying to streamline the case. You know, how much is too much and is overwhelming? Um, and so uh, we made our best decision about how much evidence we should give them, and they did their best with it. So, you know, we're very gratified for their hard work and we accept their verdict. Now, either one of you can answer this question. You know, a lot of people are, are happy that today happened and all of these convictions came down. Some not so happy or some may be asking, why not go after the people who took the bribes, people who benefited and got millions and millions of dollars by sort of paying to play with Kwame Kilpatrick, Bobby Ferguson. So with respect to the bribe payers, certainly it takes two to play, but the bribe receiver, the public official, and the business person who's paying that bribe. Where we had sufficient evidence that the bribe payer committed a crime and had willful intent, we did prosecute those people. There were four bribe payers who were prosecuted and actually testified at the trial as cooperating witnesses. But others, you know, are part of that vast spectrum, and we make an assessment of were they a criminal or were they a victim in this case, and how's a jury going to perceive that? Because they certainly were extorted and pressured and so we try to make an assessment of where that person fits on the spectrum when we decide how to treat them. Mr. Foley a lot of people are going this day is over but are there other people to go after at this point? Are there more investigations to come or perhaps ongoing right now? There are other investigations that uh, we're looking into and of course uh, we feel that same sense of relief uh, because I think that um, the city of Detroit uh, feels that sense of relief. Can you both talk a little bit about 
how much time and energy has gone into this? I mean, um, Robert Beckman, the lead case agent, 10 years investigating your your prosecutors, Mr. Chuckle, Mr. Bellata, also de a decade into this. I mean, t t this was a huge commitment, and, and why is it so important to make that kind of commitment for something like this? Well, considering the the, the vastness of the of the enterprise, um, uh, the investigation required attorneys, it required accountants, it required countless and countless of hours of the investigative team as well as the uh, prosecutors who put the case together, all of which is aimed at achieving the result so that the city of Detroit can receive the honest services that it deserves. Uh, Barbara, I have a question for you because, of course, it, during our earlier uh, newscast, we were talking to former FBI uh, executive Dan Roberts, who said a lot weighed on your career with this case. I mean, you've got to feel proud, maybe not celebrating, but this has been a long time coming, and it seems you did everything right and then got the right result today. I mean, is this a day to feel proud about your career and where you are and what you've done with this case? Well, it's not about my career, but I am proud of the work that was done in this case by the agents and the prosecutors who worked really tirelessly. They, you know, I can't tell you how many nights, weekends, holidays they missed away from their families. They don't get any overtime pay for the work that they do in this case. So I'm so grateful to them and proud of them for the work that they've done on behalf of our city. And, and another question, you both talked about how this is a, we can look forward to the future and a brighter day in the city of Detroit. Do you think when other young politicians perhaps want to run for office, they'll think twice and may think one of you or someone else might be tapping them on their shoulder and looking to make sure they follow the rules? Well, I sure hope so, because that's exactly why we do a case like this, to deter people in the future. You know, when you look at this case, 35 defendants prosecuted and convicted to date in the Kilpatrick administration. I, I think there are a lot of good people who went to work with, for him with all the best of intentions but that corruption is like poison when you see everybody around you getting a little piece of the action you start to wonder where's my piece of the pie and so that poison permeates I think when uh, people realize that that is not acceptable in the city of Detroit it'll attract good people to run for public office. So the, so the, the culture of corruption has now ended? Yes and I also want to point out that this is in the past the Kilpatrick administration the Bing administration is uh, uh, very helpful and, uh, and honorable. Barbara McQuaid, Robert Foley, thank you both for joining us today. Thank we certainly you. appreciate your time. Thank you. Stephen. And coming up next on 7, the 12 people who changed the lives of Kwame Kilpatrick, Bobby Ferguson, and Bernard Kilpatrick. Jim? Yeah, one of the jurors here said what she heard during this five-month trial turned her stomach, and she voted twice for Kwame Kilpatrick. What about the rest of the jurors, the finders of fact in this case? We have more of their comments coming up. I think it's fair. I think it's very fair and that Kwame should pay for what he's done to this city, the infrastructure of this city. Were you shocked at all? No, no, not at all. I was shocked that it was a couple hung jury counts there, but otherwise, no, he should go. There are 12 people on the jury in Kilpatrick corruption trial. That jury made up of eight women and four men. Four of the women are African American, three are white and one is Hispanic. Of the men on that jury, three are white and one is African American. The jurors listened to five months of testimony, not one of them calling in sick during the time of the trial. Seven Action News reporter Jim Kirchner spoke to some of the jurors after that verdict today. And did they ever waver on their decision, does it appear, Jim? No, Stephen. In fact, they actually reached the verdict Friday afternoon. They filled out the 22-page verdict form, gave it to Judge Nancy Edmonds, and said, we want to sleep on it over the weekend. They came back first thing this morning and made no changes. Not all 12 spoke as they were seated in the jury box. Nobody gave their name, and they said they did not want to be interviewed after this. One African-American woman who lives in Detroit says she voted for Kwame Kilpatrick twice and is not angry, but disappointed. She thought Kilpatrick would be a good leader, but she saw a lot that really, really turned her stomach. She said, I couldn't believe these things were going on. She also felt bad for the families, sadness for the children. Those who did talk say they 
based their verdicts on the evidence and the testimony. They did not watch news reports as they were told they could not, even though one said she was tempted. Juror number seven, an African American female, calls herself a social media fiend. She said to herself, Wow, I'm a juror. She gave up the social media with no rehab, she said. That caused laughter. Juror number six, a white male, said this is not a victimless case. They are a diverse jury. They are the voice for the community in these charges. He later said there was no anger at the defendants. The jurors were heavy hearted. They had a large responsibility, and he said, We did that responsibly, understanding the importance. Juror number 12, a white female, said, If you do something illegal and the evidence is there, the jury will make the right decision. When asked if the witnesses who testified that they paid bribes but were not charged, she responded, I'm sorry, that's not my call. Now, the jurors also talked about their personal sacrifices during this five month trial time lost on their job, time lost with their families, but they all say they're proud of the verdicts they rendered here this morning. Stephen? All right, Jim, thank you so very much for that. By the way, once the three are sentenced, here is the prison time they could face for Kwame Kilpatrick, up to 20 years behind bars, Bobby Ferguson also up to 20 years in prison. But for Bernard Kilpatrick, he faces up to three years in prison for his one conviction today. Bobby Ferguson's attorney, Mike Ratai, along with our seven legal analysts, Tom Cramer, join us now on what transpired uh, today in court. I mean, Mike, let's start with you. Got to be a disappointing day. I mean, you've been so passionate. We've been listening to you uh, in and out of court. Uh, how, how do you feel? What do you say to your client? Well, to answer your first question, um, we're, we're, uh, that we're, you know, we're disappointed, obviously. Um, you know, we put a lot of work into it. And uh, we laid it all on the line every day, and uh, and uh, we were out there defending our clients' constitutional rights, and that's what we're paid to do. Now we saw we saw a confidence on the part of of Bobby Ferguson and Kwame Kilpatrick specifically over the course of this trial, and today it just looked, at least for Kwame Kilpatrick, like it fell apart. Bobby Ferguson still maintained quite a bit of composure. I mean, did they did they uh, did all? I'm, I'm I'm sure you do. You're an attorney. You believe you're going to win this thing, but they were so convinced of that. Well, I mean, you know, why get up in the morning and, and show up for court if you think you're going to lose? Um, every morning I get up and I show up for any of my clients, I think I'm going to win, and there was no difference in this case. So, you know, again, I'm disappointed. Um, I'm a little surprised by some of the by by the verdict in in part but um, you know it is what it is uh, you know we 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 work in this system uh, we believe in the system and uh, we have to accept the the verdicts that uh, that juries come up with in our cases and um, you know that's that's life I've got to tell you, we followed this case closely, as you know. Uh, our investigator, Heather Catalo and Ross Jones, they were in court every day. I remember talking to Heather day in and day out, and she would always say, well, the prosecution did a great job today, and then she'd come right back behind it and say, but the defense did a great job, you know, poking holes and putting doubt into the minds of the, of the jurors. I mean, what happened? I don't know. I mean, you have to ask the jurors. Um, you know, like I say, they're, they're the ultimate uh, arbiters of the facts. And, um, you know, uh, they issued the verdict that they issued, and, and we have to live with that. Of course, we have other moves to make uh, down the road here, but um, for today, it's a tough pill to swallow. Tom Cranmer is with us right now. Tom, uh, attorney to attorney, you, maybe you, you can see that question that you'd like to ask, and I know attorneys don't like to pick each other's cases apart, but, but what is it you would like to ask Mike about this trial and the way he approached it? Well, uh, I don't know if it's so much a, a question as it is a compliment. I think the lawyers on both sides did an excellent job, and uh, you really pointed that out, uh, Carolyn, that uh, we saw day after day that the prosecution uh, called certainly a great number of witnesses and presented their side, but uh, it wasn't just that side. The defense lawyers were there. Uh, getting the full story, if you will, and ultimately, of course, uh, it was the jury's decision to make, and they made it. Mm. And, and uh, Tom, we've talked to you about this as well. I mean, with Kwame Kilpatrick going into court, Bernard Kilpatrick going into court, and Bobby Ferguson going into court, they all seemed so confident, and it seems like Kwame Kilpatrick's demeanor didn't change, at least according to our reporters, until the verdict started being read, and then his mouth dropped open, and then during that bond hearing, he just sort of fell apart. And I think it was the weight of the, the day, the moment, everything kind of coming together probably that was impacting him, I would think. 
And uh, but as Mike said too, as you're going into a trial to an extent, it's a battle, and you have to go in with a confident air. You go in believing that you can be successful, and I think we saw that on both sides, both the prosecutors and their witnesses, and the defendants and their defense lawyers. We're here with Bobby Ferguson's attorney, Mike Rattai, and Mike. Uh, the, also today, it was, it was a surprise actually a lot of people that they were not given bond. It's a little unusual in federal cases that they're not violent criminals. And normally they're given bond, but yet these two guys handcuffed and whipped out of there. Well, I don't want to comment on that because uh, obviously there's still some things that are going to happen down the road here, and I don't want to talk about that. But um, I think your comments are right on. Um, you know, I've represented a lot of people in 24 years in federal court, and um, and uh, people that were charged with uh, more heinous crimes, if you will, and uh, were given bond. But the judge made the decision that she made, and we have to respect that. Uh, but um, uh, we're not done. Uh, you know, challenging. That decision. So the, the the former executive of the FBI who ran the office from 2004 to 2007 uh, said clear as day on our air that he felt Kwame Kilpatrick might be a flight risk because he has nothing to lose at this point. Do you totally disagree with that? Well, of course. Where's he going to go? Okay, the man's six foot five. Everybody knows who he is. He's got a GPS tether on his ankle, and there's uh, certainly other um, uh, measures that uh, uh, the court could have taken in terms of. Uh, um, ensuring that they weren't going to be flight risks. They're certainly not dangerous to the community. And um, like I say, where are they going to go? Mike Ressa, I thank you very much for stopping by. I know it's been a tough uh, day for you after a long, long, long few months. So we well, thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very sir. much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right, coming up, we'll have more on the uh, Kilpatrick corruption trial and the fireworks inside and outside the courtroom. We're also going to take a look. We're also going to take a look at the highlights of this five-month-long case when this special edition of 7 Action News comes right back. Mike, Put just down. answer. Be a man. Quit being such a man. Now yeah, you guys work, so that... I think the city suffered through their whole lot and still suffering behind all this mess, and I'm just glad it's coming to an end. You know, everything is going to... Whatever the jury decided, it's best for them. Federal investigation that's been going on for more than 10 years still came down to five months of drama inside and outside this building that no one could have ever predicted. 7 Action News investigator Heather Catalo has been there from the very start. Heather's going to walk us through this complicated case. Okay, hit it. <laughs> all right, well, there was so much drama over the last five months, and before it all got underway, former Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick predicted a much different outcome than today's verdict. This time I'm not guilty, and I feel very strongly about fighting for myself and fighting for what is right. And so I want to expose the wrongs of a lot of things, uh, and I'm looking forward to this fight. For more than five months, the fight in Judge Nancy Edmonds' courtroom was over the truth, a battle of legal minds and healthy egos that sometimes came to blows. You're an ignorant moron. Mike, What's just that? answer. Be a man. Quit being such Be a, a man. man. Be a man. And the combat from this trial left more than a few marks, like the two defense attorneys hospitalized as they went to the mat for their clients. This was full contact lawyering, okay? In the Fed's corner, who better to tell the story of Kwame Kilpatrick than the people who were once his friends? His old high school pal, Derek Miller, who testified that Kilpatrick took a $10,000 bribe in a restaurant bathroom. The former mayor's college buddy, Malin Clift, said he brought Kilpatrick $90,000 from his friend Bobby Ferguson, money the Fed said Ferguson got through extortion. Yeah, she can't make a statement, guys. The former mayor's campaign fundraiser, Emma Bell, testified testified that Kilpatrick was like a son to her, a son who made her kick back hundreds of thousands of dollars that were raised for his campaign and nonprofit Kilpatrick Civic Fund. Mr. Hardiman, how come you couldn't answer any questions about your own company today? And there was a parade of millionaires, businessmen who once wrote big checks to get Kilpatrick elected, now saying they were also extorted by the ex-mayor or his friend, Bobby Ferguson. Business tycoon Tony Suave said he had to shower Kilpatrick with private jet travel worth more than $260,000 and gifts like a $6,000 watch for Bernard Kilpatrick. An official for construction powerhouse Walbridge Aldinger said they had to promise to hire Bobby Ferguson in order 
order to land a $75 million city sewer deal. Did Mr. Cato give you cash? But the government didn't land all of its punches. In between testifying that he was shaken down by Kilpatrick and his dad, Cobo Center contractor Carl Cato said he thought he might have dementia. Not exactly music to prosecutors' ears. And defense lawyers pounced on Cato's inconsistent testimony. Um, I think at the end of the day, I don't think the man has much credibility. Certainly he's trying to save his skin. And while Kilpatrick was fighting to stay out of prison, he found himself in jail because of restitution he owes to Detroit from his 2008 perjury case. The former mayor was caught on this Walmart surveillance video accepting a $2,000 wire transfer from a Chicago pastor. Parole officials say he wasn't honest about the transaction. Being that I'm Kwame Kilpatrick and this is Michigan and Detroit, uh, and the rules are different for me. Not long after his short jail stint was over, Team Kilpatrick got its chance to go on the offense. The defense team's best witness may have been former mayoral aide Sharon McPhail. She lambasted many of the government's star witnesses, calling them liars or opportunists. I can't imagine him Bill giving money to anybody. <laughs> That's not the way that worked. McPhail's testimony went far better than the defense's second witness, a nonprofit expert who was called to help cast the controversial Kilpatrick Civic Fund in a more positive light. But Gary Lehman laughed out loud when the government asked him if the nonprofit should have paid for Kilpatrick's yoga lessons. Not even close, he said. It's like football. You have to take what they, what they give you. The defense only called 11 witnesses. Because the prosecution had the burden of proof, defense lawyers reminded the court that they didn't have to call any, and they said the judge limited some of the witnesses they did want to put on the stand. By trial's end, both sides were brimming with confidence after delivering powerful closing arguments, and Kwame Kilpatrick seemed more sure than ever that his pretrial prediction would come true. I'm not going to prison. Uh, I'm not going to spend another day there. Of course, that's not what's going to happen. Kilpatrick and his friend Bobby Ferguson will be spending a lot of time behind bars. To talk about today's verdict, we brought together a lively pair of longtime Detroiters who are known for their love of the city and their willingness to share their opinions. Sam Riddle, a longtime political consultant who not only knows what Kwame Kilpatrick is going through tonight, but you know what's going on at City Hall. Also, you, attorney Mike Stefani, who sued and won when uh, his then client, Gary Brown, was fired by the Kilpatrick machine. Boy, do we remember that. Uh, Mike, let's start with you because it seemed like the text messages that you brought forward in your case, I mean, they were the big hammer in the room. All of the jurors were talking about those text messages, so were the prosecution and the defense? They, uh, they de definitely played an important role, uh, and uh, I was just uh, lucky that uh, we were able to get them in our case, and uh, because I'm not sure, most people knew they were available. Most people felt when you text mess message someone, it, uh, the record only recorded the number you called or the, uh, the number that was calling or texting. But th we found out it actually records the, uh, the, the uh, information verbatim. We'll get back to some of the uh, of how what you started continued through today. I wanted to ask Sam though. Uh, Barbara McQuaid said this is the 35th conviction out of this Kilpatrick administration at City Hall. Is there a uh, uh, this whole corruption, this this sense of of entitlement at City Hall? Well, here's what occurs. Okay. It's not as simple as a culture of corruption. It's worse than that. I call it a cesspool of corruption. And we behave as if that's how we do things and it's the right way to do things. But I can tell you, as one who's wallowed in that cesspool of corruption, it's not how we should do things. The people of Detroit deserve honesty in their leadership. Quite frankly, they haven't been getting anything close to that. And the people of Detroit deserve much more than they've gotten. And quite frankly, um, when I apologize to the people of Detroit for my behavior, I cannot give an ESPN-like apology. It's too serious for that. We were wallowing in it. We knew what we were doing, and we did not deviate from it because everyone around us was doing it. And it was the way we did things, the way we rolled, if you will, in Detroit. But, th but there was also a... a, a 
a lot of fear in Detroit. We know that you were part of the corruption. We know that you served time behind bars, and you're talking about it now. How were you lured into this this culture of corruption in the city of Detroit? Was it just about the money? Was it just about well, benefits? Well, I, I don't even think if you looked at the money that some of us actually dealt with, it wasn't really any large numbers. But what happens in is, this case? In, in this case, well, I, 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 I wasn't rolling in the Kilpatrick okay, okay. circle like that at all. As a matter of fact, on the fringe is not even inside as that. But the point I'm making is that there's a mentality and it's just like a form of peer group political pressure, if you will. But you know, if we just did what our mothers and fathers taught us when we were younger, if we just chose right over wrong, we wouldn't get caught up in that crap. Somewhere along the way, we lose our way. Mike Stefani, uh, the text message scandal really kind of set in motion this idea that the Kilpatrick administration was not invincible. Would you agree with that? I would. I would. I think it showed, of course, I was saying for three years before we got the text messages that Kwame Kilpatrick was a very untruthful person from the depositions I took. Uh, many, many instances where uh, he was just fabricating information. So the text messages, though, uh, really put the... But, but you got in trouble yourself for bringing these sure. text messages forward. I mean, do you regret it at all, or are you just glad that you brought you brought to light this case and so many others? I, I don't regret. I regret that I uh, maybe uh, the way I did it, perhaps, and I got in trouble because I didn't serve a subpoena on the other side ahead of time. However, I knew if I served it, they would prevent the documents because me from getting the documents because they had done it in the past and I felt that uh, they played some dirty tricks on me and that entitled me to play some dirty tricks on them but it's not the way the lawyer uh, a lawyer should uh, should conduct themselves. As a matter of fact, this guy should probably have received a Pulitzer himself. <laughs> All right, we're going to have <laughs> to stop both. it right there. <laughs> Mike Stefani, Sam Riddle, thank you for joining us. And we'll be right back. It was certainly a day of uh, tension and high drama outside the home of Kwame Kilpatrick's mother, where he has been living during these final weeks of the trial. 7 Action News investigator Scott Lewis was outside the house before the verdict came down, and all day long as the news kept getting worse for Kilpatrick, Scott, you were not exactly uh, welcome out there in front of that house, were you? Far from it, Carolyn. The Kilpatricks haven't been big fans of the news media for a long time. After all, reporters were on the ex-mayor's case even before the feds, and we never let up. Today, the tension was especially thick. It was a day of angry words, no comments, and cop cars. How are you feeling, Kwame? Kwame Kilpatrick had nothing to say as he left his mother's house to hear the jury's verdict. But the normally cool and confident former mayor was looking stressed. After the jury dropped the hammer, friends and relatives showed up, and they were not happy to see reporters who were barking out questions. Someone yelled out to the media to leave. Get out of his face! Get out of his face! Minutes later, the police showed up. Not one car, but six. They said somebody had called to say the family was being disturbed. Kilpatrick's uncle told reporters there would be no comments. We we have, we have no comment, period, no comment, and you can stand out here all day long. We have no comment. After the former mayor was detained, his mother, former Congresswoman Carolyn Cheeks Kilpatrick, arrived home. I won't. Could I get, could I get just a comment from you, Congresswoman? No. No comment from her either except for a warning to stay off her grass. But Kilpatrick's uncle did an about face and talked about the family's reaction to the ex-mayor being convicted and immediately locked up. It's a very big blow for them and an extremely big blow for the city of Detroit. The city of Detroit will now be destroyed. Why also, do you say sir, that? Also. Read your Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a long story, Sodom and Gomorrah, but the short version is that God destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because he could find no righteous people there. The mayor's uncle, Ray Cheeks, also told me as he was walking away that he didn't think the jury was fair to Kilpatrick. I think you read the story a little too closely there. Scott, thank you so much. Well, Mayor Dave Bang in the throes of a different type of crisis for his city. He weighs in on what transpired in the federal courthouse today when this special edition of 7 Action News comes right back. If you think the politics of the past is what Detroit needs, I'm not your man.
As we've been hearing all day, many see the verdict as an end to a painful chapter in Detroit's history. 7 Action News reporter Julie Bonovich is live downtown. She's been talking to people on the street there, and uh, everybody, it seems, has an opinion. Julie? They do indeed, Stephen and Carolyn. We had a lot of mixed reactions from people tonight, but overall, nobody seems surprised at how this went today. He got what he had coming. They should have arrested the whole family, asked me, you know, but it is what it is. So. I feel he got what he deserved. You know, he's ripping a lot of people off. You know, Michigan, hardworking people, and he got what he deserved. The man was a good man. He, look what he did for this. Everybody want him back. God don't like ugly, and the things he did was wrong. He should pay for them. He still did some good things for Detroit. Do you think a lot of people suffered because of him? Of course. Yeah, when you steal from anybody, people suffer. Do you think the era of corruption is over in Detroit? No, by law. So that's been going on for 50 years, probably. No. We still got a long way to go, but hopefully it'll get better. Michigan survived a lot of stuff, so I believe we can uh, move on. And that seemed to be the one thing that everyone agreed on. They hope that everybody can just move forward and Detroit can move forward as a whole now that this trial is all over. Back to you in the studio. Uh, uh, Julie, when you were talking to people, are they just happy we're moving on? And did they feel, I, I heard a number of people say they didn't feel the media was fair in this case. Did you hear anything like that or, or have we done our job? Um, actually, I heard a lot of people saying that they're kind of sick of uh, the trial and sick of the Kwame Kilpatrick thing, so that's why they said they were happy that it moved on. I mean, you come out here and you ask people, everybody knows about it, everybody's talking about it, but everybody said they just wanted it to be over. All right, Julie Bonovich with the uh, Pulse of the People is War. Thank you for that live report. All right, so to come, the major part, WXYZ.com played in this uh, court hearing and the verdict. That's coming up next. Stay with us. We're right now at uh, WXYZ.com here in the Channel 7 newsroom. Alex Ba, who is one of our webmeisters, as I call him here. And WXYZ.com played an important part of this. I know the first word I got about the fact that a jury had come up with a, with a decision was when we had what's called the push alert come through on our app. And my wife yells from her phone, she goes, they have a decision. It's true. A lot of our viewers and readers actually got the first push alert from us, so make sure you go and download that app. And, you know, we wanted to bring, um, basically cameras weren't allowed in federal court, so we wanted to bring them the verdict live as it came down. So we had what we call our verdict view. And basically, as the verdicts were being announced, we were able to update the blog system. So if you were watching on our website, it was basically like you were seeing it, almost like you were in the courtroom, you know, seeing the verdict as it came in. So is that you behind these right here? I know at yeah. various times it was you and sometimes Ross Jones mm -hmm. typing in that uh, on the verdicts. I mean, those verdicts came really fast, really quickly, yeah. so there was some pressure on you to get it right. Huh? Yeah, you know, palms were a little sweaty, but it worked out okay. It worked out okay. Uh, and, and besides that, also, I know um, we had live streaming. I was watching, I was clicking on that and passing that link along. Explain how live streaming works and who is it for. Yeah, basically, we had live streaming coverage outside federal court as well as inside our newsroom, just bringing people up to date on that. Um, we also had an overwhelming response on Facebook and Twitter. A lot of our viewers and readers were um, satisfied with the verdict. We actually have a tweet here, if you want to see, from... Sure. Um, James Allen, uh, who writes, you know, my family and I feel relieved that this is over. Maybe this will get the city moving in a positive way. So a lot of comments similar to that. You know, we talked to Julie Bonovich a second ago, had uh, comments on the street. We talked to five or six people that we can put on television. Mm -hmm. But when social media comes along and you've got Twitter and you have Facebook, suddenly you can get this forum going on with hundreds and hundreds of people all commenting, and then you can read those and comment back. So it's really a, a place to converse. Very interactive, yeah. And we actually have a storify. You know, we took all those tweets, we compiled, compiled them so you you can find them on our homepage at WXYZ.com, along with, you know, in case you missed, there's 33 counts. So in case you missed a verdict right. rendered on a defendant, you can go there and check it out, too. Okay, so WXYZ.com is a good place to start. It'll also get you over to Facebook, to our page there, to our Twitter page and all that. Alex, thank you very much thank for you. all you did, and, and good job on the trial. We'll look forward to having Alex back in the newsroom with us now after the trial is over. Back to you, Carolyn. Yes, yeah, Stephen, they did a great job, and Ross Jones' uh, live blog throughout the court sessions. That was a great job as well. Mayor Dave Bing weighing in on the verdict in this trial. In a statement, the mayor says, I am pleased that this long trial has ended and we can finally put this negative chapter in Detroit's history behind us. We'll be right back.
As we've reminded you throughout this trial, cameras were not allowed inside federal court, so you were not able to see the reactions of defendants or anyone else in the courtroom unless, of course, you decided to come down to federal court yourself. What's Happen Action News investigator Ross Jones is here now with the story of three people who did just that day in and day out. And, and Ross, you were there following it. You were doing live blogs, but three people were there every single day watching this. Uh, the Red Wings, Lions, and Tigers drew thousands downtown to the Motor City. A handful of Metro Detroiters came downtown for a different kind of show. Only this one came with a front row seat, and it didn't cost a dime to get in. It's not the best entertainment, but it's the best free entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> Roy Nowitzki has come to more days of the Kilpatrick corruption trial than some of the defendants own lawyers. Along with his friend Ed Franks, they've made the trek down to federal court almost every morning, braving long security lines that sometimes stretched into the cold. Why do you have to come here? Well, sitting in the courtroom, you get to, you get to see the reaction of the jury. So I would know, not because someone else would tell me about it, so I will know. Franks and Nowitzki, who both live in Detroit, met each other here three years ago at the corruption trial of another Detroit official, former city council staffer Sam Riddle. They've been coming to high-profile trials ever since. It hurts me as an individual, as a black male, to see a father sitting at a defense table with his son. Fran Hansen travels much farther to get to court, more than an hour each way. Her interest in the case dates back to her years as a high school teacher. I have a, an intense dislike for bullies and for bullying behavior. And do you see bullies up in that courtroom? I do. I do. And like so many in Metro Detroit, Hanson believed in Kilpatrick's promise when he first ran for mayor. If you think the politics of the past is what Detroit needs, I'm not your man. I was one of those people in southeast Michigan who was optimistic when he was first elected. He was young, he was energetic, and, well, because I was a teacher, the fact that he had been a teacher counted, it counted with me. It counted for Ed Franks, too, who even voted for Kilpatrick. But that was before he heard witnesses testify that the ex-mayor put himself ahead of the people he was supposed to protect. That someone could take money from a grant that was designed to help poor, innocent black kids. And there was no one to help them. That's why I'm here. And just like the jury, these three have been weighing all the evidence they saw and heard. They come from different walks of life, but all reach the same verdict. Kwame Kilpatrick is guilty. Oh, they're guilty. I would find them guilty of the charges. So now, even though the trial's finally over, their days as court watchers are far from it. Ed, for one, says he'll still be making the rounds. If the Detroiters have taken an active role in this government, we wouldn't be here. Turns out their predictions of a guilty verdict were right on target. We should mention that some of those court watchers are actually friends now outside the courtroom. Ed and Roy often go to baseball and football games and the casino every now and then, but they will never forget these last five months, and neither will we. Right. You were there. Were the three of them there today? I saw Roy. I didn't see Ed and, I, uh, and, uh, and some of the others, but uh, if they weren't there uh, physically, I'm sure they were there in spirit. They were sharing the news. Indeed. All right, thanks. From the very beginning, the seven Action News investigators have been relentless in bringing you all the facts in this trial that has gone on now for more than five months. Heather Gatalo, Ross Jones, Scott Lewis, and Bill Proctor will talk to us next about how this all played out in court. We'll be back in just a moment. From the very beginning, as we mentioned, the seven Action News investigators have been relentless in bringing you each and every fact of this trial every step of the way for five months. It's been five long months for sure. Heather Catalo, Ross Jones, Scott Lewis, and Bill Proctor have spent that time tracking down the players, asking the important questions, getting the answers, and blogging from the courthouse to bring you complete up-to-the-minute coverage of this historic case in the city of Detroit. Start out at the end with Heather. Uh, if you had to pick a moment in this last uh, five months, what would you say that was? I think there were several moments, of course, but there were a couple of really powerful witnesses. Kathleen McCann, who was testifying about some of the interactions on some of the water department deals, and April Edgar, who's Christine Beatty's half-sister. She testified about the Civic Fund, and that's all those mail and wire fraud charges over and over again. Why did you send that check? Because the mayor told me to. So two very powerful moments. There were, there were, there were actually too many to count, but a couple, a couple other spots where perhaps the jury lost some credibility with the defense that could have been sort of that turning of the tide but a long, a long go. 
Ross Jones, you were inside that courtroom blogging for us, keeping us up to date on everything that was happening. You even rubbed elbows with Bobby Ferguson at the pop machine, I remember. I mean, what are your thoughts? I'm just thinking about uh, fathers and sons is what it's all, all coming back to me here. I mean, uh, Kwame Kilpatrick is a product of his father, everybody says, everybody who knows them well. And look where it got him. And now Kwame Kilpatrick's sons are not going to have a father for, you would think, about 20 years. And I, I, you, you just hope that they turn out. Uh, better than their dad did. Yeah, devastating certainly for the Kilpatrick family, but Bobby Ferguson as well with five kids at home. Uh, Scott Lewis, you covered uh, a lot of the, the outside of the trial. I remember seeing you doing a lot of those kinds of stories. Uh, what struck you about this trial and its effect on the city of Detroit? Well, I think it's devastating. Like Nero, I think he fiddled while Rome burned. I mean, we hadn't been hearing much about this ballooning deficit we're dealing with right now, and I think from the evidence it's clear they were pretty busy running their pay-to-play scheme and not spending enough time minding the store. I think this set the city back probably 10 years, and I think it's going to be a while before we dig out of it. But I do think having a, a verdict here mm -hmm. and having hopefully the emergency manager coming in and doing some good things, maybe we're on the way up. Bill Proctor, we're going to give you the last word. A lot of people I heard call this a media lynching. Do you agree with that, or what are your thoughts on this trial? <laughs> We in the media saw something wrong from those very first words out of Kwame Kilpatrick's, I guess his most memorable press conference, where he pounded and he said, it didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't happen. That was the party that we couldn't... Kwame Kilpatrick, guilty. Bobby Ferguson. Uh, Bernard, behind the scenes, talking to businessmen, saying, as soon as we knew Kwame Kilpatrick was about to be mayor, he said, gee guys, let's get together, it's time to make money. That's what we didn't know. Thank you all for your hard work on this. And thank you for joining us for this special edition of 7 Action News, The Verdict. You can find all of tonight's stories on WXYZ.com, and we'll see you back here for Action News at 11.